Okay, so today we're going to be picking up with the second half of what's chapter three uh, in your book. We'll be, uh, last time we talked about organelles, right? We talked about cells and organelles and what cells do. Today we'll be talking about what cells do with the DNA that's in the nucleus and how it is that proteins are made. And we'll talk about the processes of transcription and translation a little bit. We'll talk about mutations as well and what the impact of changes to the DNA are to the overall organism, you and me. Uh, then... Uh, that should we should get really close to finishing up chapter three today, and that will leave us with uh, four and five still to cover for the exam. So the first exam is when? Let's take a look at the syllabus. Exam number two is next when? Next next Thursday. Does that make sense? Is that correct? So I've got today. I've got. Thursday, and I have next Tuesday to go over those uh, materials. I got a couple of emails about mastering assignments, and right now, as of yesterday, you only saw Chapter 3 homework, and as of midnight last night, I believe Chapter 4 homework went uh, available for you, and Chapter 5 homework will appear in a couple of days. So just know that the homework assignments will roll out in a time-appropriate way, and the quiz that you will do in preparation for exam two also is posted, but I don't think you yet see it. Um, it it'll go live later this week when it's more appropriate for you to start that. So just keep, a, keep, a mind, keep an eye on those mastering assignments and keep an eye on your syllabus and keep listening to announcements and look for notes from me about any uh, reminders of things. Are there any questions, anything logistical that I need to be aware of or any, any concerns from you? few of you have come to look at your exam, thank you. Uh, keep in mind that that exam is available up until pretty much next week uh, when we give the second exam. So please take a time to stop by the office, take a look at it. I think it's helpful to look over the key, look over your exam, see where your strengths and weaknesses were, find out if I made an error. I mean, every once in a while I make an error. And so please uh, come by and check it out. You'll, uh, I think you'll benefit from it. We become better test takers by reviewing previous tests, so keep that in mind. So let's take a look. Vocab on the next exam. Let me see if I remember this. It's going to be 17 through 36, I believe. And we went through, last time, 22. Let me pick up with 23 and go four or five more slides with you. Vocabulary, like I mentioned last time, went reasonably well, actually quite well, for most of you. There were a couple of students who really struggled with the vocabulary. If you're one of those students and you know who you are, Please get with me. Let's figure out a plan to help you be successful on the vocabulary portion. So derm, uh, dermatitis, dermatology, um, the dermis, these are all terms relating to the skin. Detruse, to force away, there is around your bladder a muscle called the detruser muscle, and it is part of the muscle that is going to squeeze to empty your bladder, to force away. Dextro means to the right of. If you're right-handed, you might be considered dexterous, if you will. Uh, ambidextrous, able to do things with both hands. Uh, DI, two. So anything with DI in front of it, diploid, for example, means a cell has two sets of chromosomes, and we'll see that term today, diploid. And then dia, through or across. Dialysis, diameter, are all terms that you've seen that dia in. Uh, diastole. When we get to the heart, we'll talk about the diastolic and the systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is the time when the heart is, is the pressure when the heart is not pumping. It's that relaxation or that time in between the beats. Dips, thirst. Uh, polydipsia would be excessive or very much thirst. Dis. There's a few different meanings for this. Uh, apart or opposite or absence. Let me give you an example of each of those. So to dissect is to pull apart. To disinfect is to have the absence of infectious agents. And when we think about uh, our skeletons up week, start, starting this week, Wednesday and next Monday, you'll be doing lab four. Lab four is the skeleton and the skeletal system. And we will have skeletons in the room that are all put together. And then we'll have other boxes of bones and those Boxes of bones will be considered disarticulated skeletons. They've been taken apart. Uh, dipple, double. Again, diploid uh, we see as another example. Diuret. Diuretics are medications that uh, cause one to urinate. So diuret to pass urine. 
you already know that dorsal means the back. Duct, to lead or to draw, prefix or as a, as a root. So we'll see the term like ovarian duct. There's a tube, right, a, a structure through which the egg is drawn through. Or adduct, where you move the body away from uh, the, the, or you move an, uh, like an arm or a leg away from the body. Dur, um, hard, around the brain, around the spinal cord, there's a layer called the dura mater, and the dura literally means hard. It's, it's not like rock hard, but it is a tougher outer layer. I'll finish up with this today. So dynia is pain. Dis, something that's painful or bad. So dysuria would be painful urination, as an example. E, like exit, uh, out or from, and if it ends in eel, it means pertaining to. Now, what else means pertaining to? We had it canal, right? So it canal and eel, all three meaning pertaining to. So we'll finish up there for today, but keep in mind we will be going through 36. I'll do five more on uh, Thursday and then five more next Tuesday, and that'll get us through the list for exam number two. Let's take a look at... Uh, I know it says here in my notes, chapter four. It's actually just the second half of chapter three for you. And we, we finished up with the first half, and that was uh, organelles. So was there anything in the organelle story, anything about recognizing organelles, knowing their function, uh, that I need to clarify before we move on? We got the organelles down. We can recognize them in the cell. We have a sense of what they're doing. Um, on the exam, I, just kind of thinking about it, there will be a picture of a cell for sure, and you'll be asked to identify organelles. So last time on the exam, we had one picture on directional terms, a couple pictures identifying body systems, and we had a term recognizing planes and sections. There'll always be PowerPoint images on my exams where I'll ask you to you know, identify something that we've gone over. So it's kind of a visual portion of the exam. So definitely be able to recognize, identify the organelles, and then also know what each one is doing. So we finish up that conversation and kind of start this conversation with DNA. And the reason is the second half of chapter three we'll be talking about what is it that the cell does with this DNA and how is it that this DNA is the control molecule for the cell and how is it that the cell makes proteins uh, from this DNA. So that's where we're heading. So as a quick reminder, uh, we've got the double-stranded DNA molecule. You see that at the very top, what you would recognize. So here's, here's what we recognize. Uh, the phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA. It's a double-stranded molecule, so we've got this winding staircase. And then the steps would be the bases. Now those bases would be, for example, A and T, thymine and adenine. And they always match up as a pair in making the stairs. And then there's the other pair would be cytosine and guanine, C and G. So we see that double-stranded DNA up here. We recognize, though, that DNA is, if you could stretch out all the DNA within each of your cells, it would be about six feet long. It's an amazingly long molecule. And we have to squeeze that six-foot molecule down into, or these these chromosomes, right? So really what you have are 46 very long molecules that are squeezed down and wrapped around tightly into the nucleus of every cell, okay? So we've got to figure out a way to wrap that DNA very, very tightly around something, and it gets wrapped around proteins. Now, these proteins are called histones, histones. And that name is you know, something like a, a guy singing group, right? Histones. But the histones are positively charged proteins. And that makes sense because remember that DNA is very negatively charged. So DNA is negatively charged, and these, these uh, histone proteins are positively charged, so it makes up this little magnetic-like attraction. And the DNA now wraps around groups of these histone proteins, and this little cluster, each of these little beads on a string, is referred to as a nucleosome nucleosome, okay? So each of these little round clusters is a nucleosome, and then these nucleosomes continue to, to twist and to turn and to more tightly condense. The word is condense. It, 
it condenses down, it, it shrinks down, it tightly winds up to the point where we can see chromosomes. Now, we only see chromosomes during what part of the cell cycle? We only see chromosomes during mitosis, right? We don't see them during the G phase or the S phase. We only see chromosomes under the light microscope during the actual dividing time, right? During mitosis. The rest of the cell cycle, the DNA is unraveled more. It's, it's doing its job, as we'll see in a few minutes. During mitosis, the cell has to take this these 46 long molecules and condense them so tightly that they can be easily accounted for and then separated to make the two daughter cells. If the DNA did not tightly condense, it would be like my kids putting up Christmas lights in November if they didn't put them away properly, right? You get just strings of lights everywhere and they're all tangled together. That's what the cell would be dealing with if it didn't wind up the, the DNA tightly into 46 little chromosomes and then separate during anaphase and, and telophase. If it didn't tighten, tightly wind them up so much that if they become visible, then we'd be trying to untangle a bunch of cords, right? It'd be a mess. And so that's how the cell deals with six feet of DNA having to be copied and then separated during uh, mitosis. It's a really cool story. There's a lot more to it, but we'll just leave it there for now. So then the chromosome then is the most organized, right? It's the most organized level of genetic information. And keep in mind that a chromosome is not just DNA, right? It is DNA wrapped around many proteins, these histone proteins. So collectively, we call this chromatin. And that word's coming up somewhere, but I'll put it on here for now. So when you have DNA and the proteins, collectively we call that chromatin. So in, in re, really, then, your chromosomes are composed of chromatin, right? A combination of DNA and these proteins. Now, we've already talked about the cell cycle, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, every one of your cells is somewhere in its cell cycle. Your cells, many of them are dividing rather quickly, like your epithelial tissues. Other cells are dividing very, very slowly, if at all. There, you have some cells that just never, once they're formed, they do not divide again. They never get those instructions to divide. And not only are you constantly making new cells, but you are constantly destroying already made cells. And that process of programmed cell death is referred to as apoptosis. I mentioned it in passing very quickly last time. And what organelle do you think would be largely involved with apoptosis? What organelle would be involved with destroying or breaking down a cell? And I'm hearing the lysosome, right? So the lysosome is an important organelle in apoptosis. So this is, this is normal, right? This is supposed to happen. You are making millions of new cells every day, and you're destroying new cells every day. And I got to this part with you last time, didn't I? Right, so I mentioned briefly, I just want to get us ramped back in, um, that we care about cell cycle and we care about how quickly cells are dividing, especially when we think about early development, right, blastula formation and getting that blastula to the uterus. And we also, as a moment, we'll talk about uh, the cell cycle when we think about tumors and cancer. That's another place where we need to really understand the cell cycle. So I left you last time with just a quick reminder that the cell cycle overall is divided up into four phases. There's G1, S, and G2, which collectively is called interphase. This is the time where the cell is not dividing. This is where it's growing and doing all the things that cells do. And then once it's gone through interphase, it enters into mitosis, or the M phase. And we know how to recognize these four phases or stages of mitosis, we recognize that the cell goes through a preparation time called prophase. It goes through metaphase, where the chromosomes are very characteristically lined up. It goes through anaphase, where the uh, chromosomes are being pulled apart and the cells beginning to divide. And then telophase is where clearly we've got two cells being formed, lots of cleavage in between, and basically we have about formed two daughter cells, which then will separate and go through the entire cell cycle themselves. So your job is to recognize uh, the stages. I also want to point out that timing-wise, it always looks like in these images 
that mitosis takes up a big chunk of time in the cell cycle. And what do I want to impress upon you is they stretch out mitosis only to allow us to see these different stages. But in time, it's very, very rapid. So the cell cycle could take eight hours in the fastest growing cell. It could take months, right, in the slow growing cell. But mitosis is very, very rapid. We're talking minutes. So it's not like it's one fourth of the cell cycle. It's a very rapid process. Because during mitosis, I think you'll appreciate this more in a few minutes. During mitosis, the chromosomes are all wrapped up, right? And they're about to be divided into the two daughter cells. When the chromosomes are all tightly wrapped up, the cell can't do its business. So basically, mitosis is like inventory for the cell. It had to divide, it had to condense all the chromosomes and then quickly divide. So it had to account for everything in the cell. But during that time when the DNA is tightly wound up and dividing, the DNA is not accessible to the cell to do the business of the cell. So this has to be a very rapid process. So we, we finish the cell cycle, we rapidly divide, and then the DNA unwraps again, and it can do the business of the cell. And then when it comes time for that cell to divide, the DNA wraps up, very quickly divides, and goes through it again. So don't get caught up thinking that mitosis is like 50% of the time of the cell cycle. That's just for visual uh, help. So if I show you these pictures, you should be OK. Um, if I see a cell, and actually the cartoons here are more clear, I see the chromosomes appearing. I see the mitotic spindles being formed off the centrioles, and the chromosomes are appearing, and the nucleus seems to have gone away. This is what? That's prophase, isn't it? Before that, the cell, I see the nucleus. So there's the nucleus. Here are the centrioles, but I don't see any mitotic spindles spinning out from them. And I don't see any X chromosomes. I don't see any Xs, right? Chromosome-like structures in the nucleus. So this is during the growth part of the cell cycle. This is interphase. The, the next two, I think, are the easiest to recognize, or the next three. Now we clearly see the chromosomes are lined up. So this would be metaphase, right? no problem there. We see them being pulled slightly apart. That would be anaphase. And then we clearly see the cleavage. The nucleus is reforming. The centrioles and the mitotic spindles are kind of disintegrating. And that is clearly telophase. Again, when I ask you to identify these stages, they will be really nice primo examples. They won't be questionable. They won't be in the middle of two stages or, gee, I'm not sure if that's anaphase or if that's telophase. It will always be very, very clear. Now, mitosis is not the only kind of cell division. It is by far the most common. Uh, most of the cells in your body do mitosis to make exact copies of themselves. There is, however, another form of cell division. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to know about it, and that is meiosis. Meiosis is a very specialized type of cell division, and it occurs only in the, in the making of your sex cells, uh, that is, your gametes. Okay, so sex cells, another word for, for the sex cells are the gametes. Okay, and this is the egg or sperm. So in the making of egg or sperm, uh, we have to use this process of meiosis. Now in mitosis, we get two identical cells. In meiosis, we get haploid cells. So here's that word. This one's new for you. Haploid means cells with one set of chromosomes. Diploid, we saw in the vocab, means two, or double. So in a diploid cell, there's two sets of all the chromosomes. That's the case of most of the cells in your body. 99.9% .9 of your cells are diploid. They have two sets of all the chromosomes, and that number would be 46 chromosomes. You have two sets of 23. 23 chromosomes came from your dad. 23 chromosomes came from your mom. And that's exactly what we see here. In sperm, there are only 23 chromosomes, one of each. In egg, there's only 23 chromosomes, one of each, and we say that they are haploid. Okay? So diploid, two copies, haploid, one copy. And how did egg and sperm get only one copy? Through the process of meiosis. So in meiosis, you get the gametes, 
you only get one set of chromosomes in each cell, and this overall process could be referred to as gametogenesis. Let's break that word down. Gametogenesis. We haven't gotten to the G's yet, I know, in our terms, but genesis, in the beginning, the formation of, and gametes. So gametogenesis, the formation of gametes. And to make egg and sperm, we must utilize this process of meiosis. So again, why do we care? Here is an example of maybe why we care that maybe we'll, you'll understand better. This young uh, lady has Down syndrome. And maybe some of you know someone with or know a family with someone in their family with Down syndrome. Down syndrome is the result of a problem with meiosis. So in the formation of egg or in the formation of sperm, something went wrong during the process of meiosis such that there was an extra 23rd chromosome dropped into um, this individual, 21st chromosome, sorry, trisomy 21, 21. So the 21st chromosome is a rather small chromosome, and what happened is that in normal cell division, right, here's a, here's a cell, the little red and blue dudes represent the chromosomes, and during meiosis, there's not one division, but two divisions. And so first, one cell makes two cells. That looks a lot like mitosis. But you'll see that um, these chromosomes split, right, into their, into their cells. Well, when this one split, these two blue copies did not separate. So that this cell got two copies of the blue. This cell got no copy of the blue. These are normal over here. Okay. So this child was, was produced using this gamete, egg or sperm. And it carried, by chance, an extra, you see the double blue, it carried an extra 21st chromosome. And that gives us the physical appearance of Down syndrome. So these individuals have some heart defects, oftentimes, some a unique facies, a unique look to them. Uh, they have usually some mental challenges uh, of varying degrees and other characteristics. Question? So it can come from any parent? Either parent. Although it is more commonly known to be carried by the female, and we'll understand that better later because eggs are stored throughout the entire woman's lifetime. And this process is more common, this non-disjunction, this problem with the splitting of the chromosomes, we know is more common in older gametes. So eggs are stored. A woman is born with all the eggs she'll ever have, and a woman who's over 35 has a higher risk of having an egg that has this process going on. Sperm are being produced daily, it's fresh. So there's less of a storage issue with sperm, and they're less likely to have this problem. But that's not to say that we, quote, blame the female, right? This is not a, an issue. But it can be egg or sperm. Either one can contribute to this problem. Now, trisomy 21, 3, try, um, there are other trisomies. Down syndrome is only caused by a trisomy of the 21st chromosome. There are also trisomies of other chromosomes, but most of them are fatal. In fact, most uh, embryos, fetuses with Down syndrome don't survive. The only ones that survive are really the survivors, if you will. So many Down syndrome um, uh, kids never make it out of the uterus. They never, they never survive. Their heart defects are too severe or something else goes wrong. So the ones that survive are truly the survivors that, that, that live, and they live now a very long life. Are there any other thoughts about Down syndrome? My point is we care about meiosis because here's a condition that is caused by a problem. And like I told you about the um, adrenal leukodystrophy, right? Why do we care about peroxisomes and lysosomes? Because sometimes these things are, go wrong. And I want you to realize that we're not learning this for some academic reason, but there's real medical reasons to appreciate these different organelles and these processes. Let me share with you a little bit about apoptosis. This is a very, very cool slide, I think. So we've got a human embryo here at about the fifth week of life. I know it's small, but this embryo is about the size of a quarter, okay? The whole embryo at this point. This is about the fifth week. And over the next five weeks, from weeks five to week 10, what I want you looking at are the arms and the legs. And what you see is at week five, the arm is a little short paddle. There's no fingers, right? It's just a big paddle. 
And over the next five weeks, the fingers form to the point where at week five, or sorry, week 10, you couldn't distinguish that hand, right? This hand looks like your hand, and these little feet look like your little feet, right? And those feet are being held by someone's adult-sized fingers, okay? So you can see now that those are fully formed little feet and fully formed little hands. What happened between week five and week 10? Apoptosis. So the paddle, the hand paddle, there was actually cells that died that separated that paddle into the fingers. Now, if that process doesn't occur properly, then a person is born with some sort of birth defect where their fingers are webbed. This same process, though, is what goes on to shape each of your bones. Right? Every bone in your body, as you'll see next week in lab or this week in lab, has a unique shape. Right? The femur looks like the femur. The radius looks like the radius. How is it that each bone has a unique shape? Well, the cells receive instructions in an amazingly complex story that tell some cells to divide and some cells to apoptose, to die. And it's that combination of living and dying and growing and not growing that gives us the unique shape of each and every bone and every part of our body. Another way of thinking about it, if in my right arm, if right now every cell decided to divide, for whatever reason, right, signals were sent and every cell in my body decided, every cell in my arm decided to divide, then my arm would either suddenly become twice as big around or maybe twice as long and I could be scratching my toes right now without bending over, right? So there's, you recognize there's a balancing act now between cells growing and dividing and cells dying and it's incredibly complex and a beautiful story that creates you and me. So another place where we care about rapidly growing cells, obviously, and maybe touches most of our lives, is tumors, cancer. Right? These are also rapidly growing cells. But what's going on here is that the signals to divide have been screwed up. And rather than behaving and dividing only when it should, tumor cells misbehave by overgrowing. Right? They grow faster than they should. They lose control of the cell cycle. So again, we recognize that understanding a little bit about this G1 and S and G2 and how is it that cells enter into mitosis or don't enter into mitosis is a critical link in the study of cancer and in tumors. So cancer, and I'm going to really oversimplify this just to get us introduced to this, but there's basically two major groups of cancers. There's benign neoplasms, benign Remember, Benny means good, right? Neo means new. We haven't had that one yet. And plasma means a new growth. So we've got a new growth that is benign. Now, if you're going to get a cancer, this is the type you probably want to get if we had to choose. And benign tumors typically are not going to kill you. There are exceptions to that. But typically, they're very slow growing. They won't spread throughout the body. They won't metastasize. They behave themselves uh, pretty well. And oftentimes, we can just go in and take that tumor out without worrying about it spreading, okay? And that's going to be a pretty good outcome if you get a benign tumor. Um, going on, though, all cancer cells, and this is an important term, all cancer cells de-differentiate. Now, that's a word that means, let me, let me back this up. The embryo, right, when you were a zygote and then an embryo, Every cell in your body, those cells, some of them became muscle, some of them became liver, some of them became kidney, some of them became skin. As cells become different from each other and take on their final assignment, if you will, we say that the cells have differentiated. So the cells become different from one another and they specialize in what they will become, quote, when they grow up. Tumor cells revert back to childlike behavior they de-differentiate. Now, what did we see going on in the embryo? Right, the embryo grows really, really fast. Those cells are de-differentiated, or they haven't differentiated yet. Right? They're very immature, young cells, and they haven't yet received their final instructions for their, their, their place in life. So tumor cells de-differentiate. In other words, they revert to a less specialized state, and that right, just like an embryonic cell causes them to grow faster. So we see that these cells are less defined, de-differentiated. They also turn, uh, tend to turn on their own blood supply. 
This is important because you've got a solid ball of cells. And you know that every cell in your body needs to have nutrients and oxygen. So a solid, a, a, a tumor can only get as large as the blood supply allows it. So for a tumor to get bigger, it must have its own blood supply. So tumors have a way of turning on new blood cell formation. And we'll get to that term in a moment of angiogenesis. Hold on to that, and I'll show you that in a moment. Now, typically, these tumors, again, are not lethal unless they are pushing up against something that's important. So if, if a benign tumor, even though itself is growing slowly, is deep in the brain and cannot be surgically excised and continues to grow and starts to push up against other things, or if a benign tumor is pushing up against you know, a series of blood vessels that are important or nerves, then it can be a more devastating consequence. But typically, benign tumors are not going to be lethal. So, again, cancers in general, um, you've got benign, and then you've got the other group, malignant. Now, these guys are more dangerous because they are unencapsulated. So if you go back, I think you'll see the word encapsulated on benign. That means that they are contained within a connective tissue capsule. Okay? So benign tumors don't spread. They're contained, whereas malignant tumors are unencapsulated. They don't have a nice shell around them, if you will. And they also are dedifferentiated. They also have their own way of increasing their blood supply. They do grow rapidly. And here's the real problem. Malignant tumors tend to metastasize. They tend to spread from one place to another. Now, they usually spread, well, they do spread through blood or through lymphatic fluids, lymph. So as I already alluded to, the real key here is that these cells lose control of their cell cycle. And it's only one cell. You have trillions of cells in your body, and it, tumors are one cell that went crazy and made more copies of themselves. So really the question isn't why, do, why, are there, why is there cancer, right? Why does a cell lose control of its cell cycle? The question really is why isn't there more? Because it only takes one cell to go whack up, right? And every tumor is the result of millions and millions of copies of that one crazy cell growing out of control. Again, cancer, the cells are growing too frequently. They've lost control. There's no longer any rules that they, that they abide by. They don't understand when to stop growing like the rest of our cells do. If I took some of my own skin cells or some of your skin cells and put them into a Petri dish in the lab with all the right nutrients in the Petri dish, your skin cells would grow. And when they reach the edge of the plate, they would stop growing. Normal cells know that when they start touching each other, that that's it. They've reached their boundary, and there are signals sent out, and normal cells will stop growing. Cancer cells, mm, they don't play by the rules. They would not stop growing, and they would start to overgrow each other, right? Creating bundles or, or tumors or big solid masses. So we say that cancer cells have lost their contact inhibition. Typically, cells have contact inhibition. So I've already said all this. Cancer cells are more de-differentiated. They go back to an earlier state. And here's the word I've, I'm, I alluded to, angiogenesis. That is, again, genesis in the beginning, the formation of angio, you know, means vessels. So angiogenesis is the process by creating or encouraging new blood vessels. The other thing about these cancer cells is because they've lost their, they've lost the rules, they're more invasive, right? It's this invasiveness, if you will, that allows them to metastasize. So cancer cells will go to places that normal cells would not go. Cancer cells will break off and travel, right, through the blood or through the lymphatic system, and they'll go to a far, far away place in your body and set up cancer somewhere else. This is what we know metastatic cancers do. So malignant tumors will spread. And for example, people who have a lung tumor, we know that it will oftentimes spread to the bones or it'll spread to the brain. And other tumors like 
uh, kidney tumors, kidney cancer, will oftentimes spread to the lung. So we know that these routes are sort of preferred or are more common. And basically what you have is the same cell that went wacko in the kidney travels and sets up the same exact cancer somewhere else in the body. So when they take a tumor biopsy, when they take a tissue sample, they'll look to see is that the primary tumor or is it exactly like a tumor somewhere else in the body? And they can tell from where did that tumor originate? Was it primarily a brain tumor that went to the lung or was it a lung tumor that went to the brain? But it's the same wacky cell that lost its control. Okay, so that's my little story about the cell cycle and hopefully why we care and why you're more, more motivated to learn about it because it's important in understanding cancer. Now, next week on, and I need to update the slide, next week on exam number two, not quiz number one, but next week on exam number two, okay, you are going to have a small written assignment. And that written assignment will include your making sentences with these words. I learned long ago that it's one thing to recognize terms, but it's another level of understanding if you can now put those words into a meaningful sentence. I'm giving you these words in advance. There's no reason why you don't do really, really well on this. But here are the words. There's 11 of them. I only want you to use 10 of them. So one you can chuck and throw out. And some of these terms we've already seen. The rules are this. You're going to write no more than three sentences. I don't want 10 definitions. I want three sentences that properly pull these words together into a one meaningful sentence. So that means that every sentence would have three or four terms in it, right? No more than three sentences. Now, right now, I bet you could write a sentence that used the word nucleus, DNA, cytoplasm, ribosomes, and rough ER. Those terms we've already had. So who wants to take a shot? Tell me one sentence that uses three or four of those words. No? The DNA is found in the nucleus, and everything outside of the nucleus is called the cytoplasm, period. That sentence just used three of those terms, didn't it? OK, it's not that hard. That's what you'll need to do. And you can certainly practice these, because I'm going to give you the same exact terms on the test next week. And we have not yet talked about some of these terms. So listen for these words as we go through this. But we haven't yet talked about transcription, translation, proteome. We haven't really said proteins much, although you know ribosomes make the proteins. Uh, we haven't talked about the genetic code. And we haven't mentioned mRNA yet. So some of these terms you've had, some of these terms are coming up in the second half of this chapter. But your job will be to make sentences, again, no more than three sentences, combining these terms. Now, I always imagine that the assignment I'm giving you is to write those review statements at the end of every chapter. Right? Whenever you're reading a textbook at the end, there's always those summary statements. And they're always very rich. They have all the ideas kind of pulled together in just a few sentences. That's sort of what you're doing here. You're writing review or summary statements at the end of this chapter. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. You can practice them. You can share them with each other. Make sure that they make sense. I will grade them. Here's what I do when I grade these. First, I look to make sure there's only three sentences. And the question I always have is, well, what's a sentence? And I said, well, something that starts with a capital letter and ends with a period. My first grader knows that, right? So a sentence. I'm not going to grade you on run-ons and fragments. That's not really my thing, right? But I need to see three capital letters that start sentences. I need to see three periods at the end designating the end of the sentence. Within those three sentences, I'm going to then count, and I'm going to look for the underlined words. You must underline these words. And I have it in here that you please, 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 or I'll remind you, as you're doing this, underline the word as you're using it, and go ahead and get in that practice of doing it, because I'm only going to look for those underlined words. Only underline each word once, right? If you say the word th DNA three times, only underline it once. But I'm going to count. So first I'm looking for three periods, and then I'm looking for 10 terms. If I see that, then you're starting off with 10. Then I read the sentence, and I ask, does it make sense? And if it makes sense, hooray, full credit. If you've rewritten the laws of biology, then you're going to lose some points, 
right? So make sure that your connections make sense and that you clearly tell me what each term, how it connects with other terms. Two more questions that always come up. The three, the three sentences do not have to flow, right? They don't have to flow nicely from one to the next. They can be independent sentences that don't necessarily flow. And the other thing that I will not allow is the following sentence. In Dr. McCauley's class, we learned about transcription, the nucleus, DNA, translation, the proteome, and the cytoplasm, period. No way. Wrong. Okay? So no lists, right? The cell contains uh, proteins, ribosomes, the rough ER, and mRNA. No. None of that kind of stuff, right? I need to know that you understand the connection between the terms. Fair enough? Okay. So that's going to be worth about 10 points on your exam next week, so it's not an insignificant portion. And again, the term that you don't have an easy time incorporating, just throw out. Okay? I'm only looking for 10 terms. Okay. So now let's move on to talking more specifically about DNA. So I've already shown you DNA, right? This is that double-stranded DNA. You know that that DNA is then wound up around those histone proteins and becomes the chromatin, which then is highly condensed and duplicated in the, in the cell such that we can see these chromosomes during mitosis. So we know that overall idea. What we're doing now is figuring out what is DNA and what is it doing and what are the processes by which it makes proteins. I would probably re be remiss, although this, is, this, this story uh, is becoming perhaps a little bit dated, but every biology book makes mention to Watson and Crick. And it was back in the 50s uh, where they published, 53, where they published the structure of DNA. I'm kind of amazed, that's only 60 years ago, and 60 years ago, in 60 years, how far we've come in understanding what DNA is and the impact that DNA has had on medicine is profound. They basically didn't do any experiments, right? They didn't create any new experiments. Instead, they liked playing with models. I bet they were great at Legos. And what they did is they took information from other scientists and they were the first folks to kind of synthesize all of those ideas and from it create a tinker toy model, right? So they created their little model and they were right, right? And when they created their model, they also hypothesized or proposed, okay, if this is the structure of DNA, then this must be why it's so important and this must be the way by which proteins are made. So they sort of predicted, right, how this whole thing worked without even knowing. And because of that aha moment they had and their tinker toy model, they got the Nobel Prize. Okay, but again, they didn't do any work. They just played with models. Kind of interesting. Now, uh, uh, Robert Watson is still alive. Uh, he went on to be in charge of many, many important pro processes or projects in the country. In fact, he was a big part of the Human Genome Project. And then Watson Crick died a while back. Um, Watson was a very young student. Crick was his professor. One of the people they ripped off ideas from was this young lady, Rosalind Franklin. Uh, she died rather young, probably from playing around with x-rays, and sort of like Madame Curie died young from playing around with radiation, and we didn't understand it all back then. Her research, and I don't expect us to understand it, I don't understand this, but she took x-rays and, and sh shined those x-rays, if you will, at DNA. And then what happened is this pattern, and this pattern told her, and also told Watson and Crick, that DNA is a round or a cylindrical molecule, right, the double helical molecule, that has a certain diameter to it, right? So there's a regularity to the molecule that was helical. So they used her information when they were putting together their Tinker Toy model, part of it. They also used data from other scientists. Now, because she died shortly after all this, she did not get the Nobel Prize. They never award the Nobel Prize to people who've already passed away. So every year when I was at, in graduate school, there'd always be this contest. Okay, who's gonna get the Nobel Prize this year? And there'd be people who were very much in the know saying, okay, who's getting really old? Um, because we wanna make sure we give them the credit of the Nobel Prize before they die. So there was always this, you know, how old are they versus the work that they did uh, sort of a discussion when predicting who would get the Nobel Prize. Now, I've already mentioned RNA and DNA in passing. Um, here's a little bit more detail about those two uh, types of nucleic acids. They both have, they're both made of nucleotides, right? And the nucleotides are, this is the nucleotide here on the right. This is a base, a sugar group, 
and a phosphate group. Those are the three pieces that make up a nucleotide. Now, the base comes in five different flavors. If it's RNA, those bases are A, C, G, and U. If it's DNA, the bases are A, G, C, and T. The difference is T or U. So if you see T anywhere in the description of the molecule, you know you're dealing with DNA. If you see U anywhere in the description of the molecule, you know that you're dealing with RNA. The other distinction is what is the sugar that's being used. In RNA, this sugar is ribose. You don't have to recognize it, but know that it's ribose. That's why it's called ribonucleic acid. The sugar in DNA is deoxyribose, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid. So the difference is in the sugar group and in the collection of bases that are in the nucleotides. This sugar group difference, the ribose versus the deoxyribose, is sort of what makes RNA typically single-stranded and makes DNA double-stranded. So the difference in the sugar makes a difference in the ability of this molecule to make a helical double helix or be a single-stranded molecule as RNA typically is. Here's another, just a, a quick view of that helical structure of DNA. Again, as a reminder, the backbone of this, you can see it written, S, P, S, P, S, P. So the backbone, right, of this helical steel, steel the, the, the handrails, if you will, of this staircase are the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone. And then the steps are the bases reaching out and holding hands. It turns out that A always reaches out and binds with T. That's something also that they did not discover, Watson and Crick, but instead ripped off from another scientist. But they turned out that A always seemed to equal T, and so they always must somehow associate with themselves. And so over here, I show you A equals T. The equals stands for two hydrogen bonds. So there's two hydrogen bonds that connect A to T. C and G are also another pair, and I show you here three lines. It's not the best typing, but you'll see an equal sign with a line underneath it. That represents that C and G are connected not by two, but instead by three hydrogen bonds. So really what you have here is a, in DNA are two strands that are connected, right? The steps are connected right down the middle by hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds, as you know, each one is very, very weak, but collectively they make a pretty significant uh, energy to hold these two strands together. A couple more definitions within DNA. These bases, A, C, G, T, and U, okay, come in two families of molecules. A and G are the purines. Who knows what the chemical symbol is for gold, or sorry, for silver? A, G, right? So if you want pure silver, okay, purines, A and G. If it helps you remember it, great. Then the pyrimidines, C, U, and T, pyrimidine looks a lot like the word pyramid. So I imagine the Egyptians had to cut the stones to make the pyramids. So the pyrimidines are C, U, and T, the purines are A and G. Okay. And what we see is that in DNA, one purine always matches up with one pyrimidine. So A binds with T and C binds with G. Now, because what happens is that one purine binds up with one pyrimidine, you can see now that the, when they link together, that the diameter of the DNA molecule stays rather constant. So you've got one purine always matching up with one pyrimidine, and that makes this helix of a set diameter. And that's what Rosalind Franklin discovered. Right? She said that DNA is a helical molecule with a set diameter. And it turns out that that means that two purines would have been too wide, and two pyrimidines would have been too narrow. So again, that's what will help Watson and Crick determine that it must be one purine binding to one pyrimidine making up this helical structure. 
Okay, back to the cell cycle again, only to remind you that DNA, awfully important in the cell, and that DNA itself is replicated, fancy word for it's copied, right? If you make a replica of something, you make an exact copy. And in the cell cycle, the cell is going to make an exact copy of the DNA during that S phase. That means that when a cell goes through G2 and then enters into mitosis, that it already has a duplicated set of everything. So a cell enters into mitosis already having replicated, having copied all the DNA and the other organelles also, so that during mitoses, right, the cell can split basically in two, creating two identical cells, and those cells would be considered diploid, wouldn't they? because the cell has already duplicated all the chromosomes. What does that mean? That means that during G2, how many chromosomes are there in the cell? If there's 46 in a normal cell, and we duplicate them during S phase, that means that actually during G2, there's actually 92 chromosomes. They're duplicated. And then what happens during mitosis? We split those 92 into two 46s. So that's sort of the cell cycle going on with DNA. Now, how does the cell do this? Well, like I said, A always goes with T, and C always goes with G. So when the cell is duplicating or replicating the DNA, it just simply looks at the letter across the street and says, OK, if you're an A, then I have to put in a T. And if you're a T, I need to put in an A. And this is the way by which we just make an exact copy of the DNA. Okay, so it's really not that difficult to imagine. The cell can do this process. The problem is, and this process is called replication, the problem is the cell has to balance speed with accuracy. Just like any company making cars, right, needs to balance how many cars can I make per day and if I make them really, really fast, I'm probably going to make some errors. And a couple of errors are OK. right? That's kind of what quality control is about. How fast do we go? But how many errors are we going to make as a result of that rapidness? So the cell has a very rapid process of replication. In fact, in E. coli, bacteria, which is where we learn mostly about replication, right? we learned about these things in bacteria, because we can grow billions of bacteria every hour and study it there a lot easier than, than studying it about in a slow-growing human or a mammal. So we know that in E. coli, which has a lot less DNA than we do, they can copy all their DNA at about 500 nucleotides per second. So during this process of replication, they can tick out 500 ACTs and Gs per second. That's a pretty fast assembly line. That allows the bacterial cell to grow very, very quickly and to divide. In you and me, that process is slower. It's about 50 nucleotides per second. That's still pretty fast, right? So, so our cell has the ability of, of clicking out 50 ACGs and Ts when copying the DNA. That means that the fastest cell in our body can divide in about eight hours, and that's what happens with epithelial cells. They are able to divide, right? So that means if a cell has to divide every eight hours, don't forget that means we also had to have counted for time to grow, and time to copy all the DNA. Right? There's a lot going on in the cell cycle. The problem is, when we're going that fast, we make mistakes. And those mistakes become known as mutations. Muta just means change. So when you're rapidly flying through copying the DNA, the enzymes that do this job make mistakes. In fact, they make mistakes about one every 100,000. Now, that would make Toyota awfully happy, right? If they could flip out 100,000 cars and only get one with a problem, that's an awfully amazing process. So our cells are amazing in that they can do all this work and only make one mistake out of every 100,000. But we also have about 5 billion ACTs and Gs. <laughs> so we have a lot of mutations that happen in our cells every time a cell divides. It's an awfully good rate but it still happens. Now, if this problem occurs in our somatic cells, let me define these two words. If you end up having a mutation in your somatic cells, I think I've alluded that this term soma means body. 
So if you have a mutation in any of your body cells, your skin, your liver, your heart cells, you can't, your, your kids won't inherit that, right? So you're not gonna pass on anything in your somatic cells. Now that mutation could lead for you to be cancer eventually, but mutations are not going to affect your kids if they are in your somatic cells. The only mutations you can pass on to your kids would be what we call germ line cells, and these would be the cells that create your egg or sperm. So if you have a mutation in egg or sperm, then those could be potentially passed on to your offspring, so they're heritable. So as the DNA is being copied, as it's being replicated, this is kind of what's going on. The cell's looking at one side of the DNA strand and saying, okay, uh, if I see a G, I need to put in a C, but occasionally it screws up. It's going so fast, it screws up, and it matches a G with a T. Okay, so it's a mismatch. Now the cell has a choice to make, because once that copying machinery goes through, all the cell sees is, oops, there's something not lined up right. But it doesn't know which one was right. Which one was the proper match? And the cell says, hmm, am I supposed to, it'll go back and correct this. Right, it'll, it'll try to go back and correct it, much like the backspace on a typewriter. If you, know, you, you guys know what a typewriter is? Right? Okay. You know, there's actually, there was a backspace and boop, it came back. Nowadays, we just put delete right, on, the, on the word processor on the computer. But it will literally go back and fix it, but it doesn't know which fix is right. It sees a G and a T and it says, that's not right. Now, if it guesses that G was the correct letter and it puts a C back in, then we're back to normal. Right, so if it, if, it, if, it correctly, if it correctly fixes it, fine, no problems. But if it guesses wrong and it says, oh, the T must have been right in the first place, so I'm going to match up an A with that T, that's not what it was originally, and that's now going to be considered a point mutation. That is, mutation, a change at a very small point in the DNA sequence. Now, that point mutation could have little effect or it could be a devastating effect, as we'll see as we go through the morning. Now, mutations are basically a permanent change in your DNA. And there's two main types of mutations. There are mutations that happen on the chromosome level, like the whole chromosome, there's something wrong. I want you to think about Down syndrome for this, right? So I showed you that problem during meiosis, and you have an extra chromosome. So the, the chromosomes don't separate properly during meiosis. And just think of Down syndrome as the example of a chromosome mutation. There's no point mutation, right? There's no ACT and G difference in Down syndrome. What happened in Down syndrome is that you have an extra chromosome number 21 versus a point mutation. Now the cell made an error in the ACT and G copying, and that error was in the germ layer, in the germ cells, and was passed on to the offspring, and this is gonna be called a point mutation. This is an error in replication, not an error in meiosis, but now an error in the copying process. This could also be a problem from the environment. So there's two ways to get these point mutations. It could be a problem with the copying machinery, an error was made and it wasn't corrected, or environmental exposure to x-rays and that sort of thing. Oops. So it turns out that just walking outside or actually just breathing oxygen can lead to mutations. Uh, we are surrounded by chemicals, right? More in this society than in the past. Uh, we're surrounded by radioactive emissions that are just naturally occurring in our atmosphere. We're surrounded by x-rays. Either you go down and have an x-ray or maybe you fly often and there's, you know, you're exposed to radiation in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, even UV light, going to the beach in the summer, right? All of those things are exposing ourselves to DNA damaging processes, so mutations can occur that way. There are no safe tanning beds. I don't care what they tell you, right? So tanning beds, um, you know, all those types of things where you're getting more UV radiation is allowing your cells to be exposed and lead to greater numbers of mutations. Now, the good news is that when you're being bombarded between your cells screwing up and making mistakes 
and being bombarded by x-rays and whatever tanning booths, the body has about 130 mechanisms, ways to try to correct these mutations. So that's good, right? We have these inbuilt ways of fixing it. Think of it as the backspace or the delete uh, button on your computer. And each of us, as a result of these mutations in our family tree, carry between five and 10 mutations that could affect our overall health. Now, we're, we're just beginning to really understand this, but you may have genes in your family that make you more prone for certain cancers. You may have certain genes in your family that make you more prone for heart disease. And if you have a child with somebody who also carries those similar genes in your own offspring, kids could be at even greater risk for some of these issues, right? So everything from diabetes to uh, heart disease to cancer, we're understanding they're all genetic issues. Cancer is definitely a genetic disease. Um, so just realize that we all carry five or 10, on average, of these genes that could cause disease. And also, as we age, the number of mutations in our own body increases. So that, that's what it shows in this graph. This is a graph showing uh, cancer, different types of cancer in aging men as a percent of the total population. And you can see that by age 80, right, there's a much higher rate of prostate cancer, uh, skin cancer, rectal cancer, esophageal cancer. And what we know is that the number of the, can sorry, the, that we know that cancer becomes more prominent when we age because as we age, we accumulate more mutations. Right? So every, every cell in your body is accumulating more mutations. So let's say I go to the beach, and I'm just pointing to my arm, and this little cell right by my watch gets zapped by some x-rays or some UV radiation and undergoes a mutation. Okay? And also while I'm at the, at the beach, uh, a cell up by my elbow also gets zapped. Okay, that happens. It's just, it's just there. That means, though, that every cell that, when, when this cell that got zapped divides, that all those daughter cells will also carry that mutation, won't they? That same exact mutation will be carried on to all the daughter cells from that point on. Now, let's say the next day I go out, and one of those daughter cells now gets zapped. Now, that daughter cell has two mutations, right? And every cell that it makes has two mutations. And then the next summer I go out, and that one of those cells from which I already had two gets zapped again, and it has three. We know that over time, as mutations accumulate, the rate of cancer goes up, right? So that's why with age, cancer goes up. It just takes time for these mutations to accumulate. Remember, it has to be in one cell, because tumors, cancer is a result of one cell going nuts, right? One cell has accumulated enough mutations that it has lost control of its cell cycle and starts growing uncontrollably. Here's the amazing thing. You are, every second, have about 25 million cells undergoing mitosis. That means you have 25 million cells completing the cell cycle. You're making 25 million new cells every second. Now, most of these cells are blood cells and epithelial cells, but that's an amazing high number. That also means that every second you are destroying, on average, 25 million cells through the process of apoptosis. Otherwise, we would just continue to grow, right? So we know we're gaining and losing cells throughout our lifespan. And as 25 million cells divide, there are going to be errors made in replication. When those errors are made in the cells, the cell has three choices to do with that mutation. Number one, or with that DNA change. Number one, it can repair it. I told you there's 130 different ways that the cells can approach when the replication machinery puts the wrong letter in there. So when G gets matched up with T, we have ways of fixing it. So we could, one, repair it, no harm done, life goes on, cell has no mutation. Number two, the cell could recognize, and now I'm giving the cell a personality here, and I'm giving the cell a consciousness, but we can think of it this way. We also could think, well, that cell realizes that that mutation is so devastating that the cell can't survive. So the cell could commit cellular hairy carry, right? Commit suicide or undergo apoptosis and just be killed. Now the organism overall is protected from that cell that would be largely mutated. Or third, live with it, right? It becomes a permanent change in the DNA from that point on. So we can fix it, we can kill it, 
or we can live with it. It's like our family, right? It's just the same thing with our family. We can, we can fix them, we can kill them, or we can live with them. Kind of makes sense, right? Now, once you live with that change, right, once that mutation is in your cells, it's there forever, right, in, in that particular cell. And this is the basis of, of Darwinian evolution, that these changes over time accumulate. Now, usually these mutations are negative. They affect us in a bad way, and we die off earlier, or we have some disease state, or they have no change at all. They don't affect us in any way. And then Darwinian evolution says those changes over time accumulate in a, in a way that makes life different, right, over time. Any questions on mutations? I think it's just really fascinating, right? I, I, think, it's, I think it's more fascinating to, to sit here and wonder, if it only takes one cell to go wacko to form cancer, why don't we have more cancer? Right? It's not why do we have cancer, but man, it's really cool that we don't have as much as we might expect. And you realize how fragile this whole process is. Questions on mutations, replication, mitosis, meiosis, anything in that conversation so far? Okay, well, let's move on and talk about what it is that the DNA is doing. Okay, it's got, we know it, it's being replicated and we know it's being copied and the goal of the cell is to copy the DNA perfectly. Right? Have you ever tried to write down a paragraph perfectly? Right? We all make mistakes when we're writing something. And so we know that problems occur as things are being copied. And then once that DNA is in our cells, what do we do with it to make protein? There are two processes here. They occur back to back. The first is transcription. Transcription is when the cell takes the DNA, takes the information in the DNA, and transcribes it or undergoes transcription to make a molecule called mRNA. Now, DNA, right, we talked about was double-stranded, and DNA is only found in the nucleus. mRNA, I haven't told you this, but mRNA is out in the cytoplasm, okay? So we'll talk about where these things are occurring. And then the mRNA is translated or undergoes translation to make the protein. And you may recall that ribosomes are the key organelle that make the proteins. Okay, so we're going to be talking about these two processes back to back. We'll start with transcription. So again, transcription is taking DNA and copying from it an RNA molecule. Remember, the DNA is double-stranded. The, the RNA is single-stranded, right? It's a single molecule. Now, to try to get a sense of this, we've got about six feet of DNA. If I could stretch out your DNA, if I could stretch out your 46 chromosomes end to end, there'd be about six feet of a very thin chromatin, right? DNA with proteins associated with it. Of that six feet, we think only about one and a half percent of that DNA, of that chromatin, is actually important in making proteins. The other 98.5 percent has been termed in the past junk. Now, we know that there's a lot more going on in that junk, and we're learning more about it every day. But the idea is only a small part of our DNA is really important for making uh, DNA, or making proteins. The rest of it is junk, or what would be called non-coding DNA. It doesn't seem to have any direct relationship. Um, let me get into this time, term of introns in a moment, and then a lot of our DNA is repetitive sequences. It just kind of repeats over and over and over and over. It seems to have no function. It makes our chromosomes longer, but it seems to have no function. And uh, we have in some of our some of our cells, we have as many as one million repeating units that seem to be there for no reason. Now, what happens is that as the DNA is copied and we make RNA from it, we've got to get rid of all this junk. All this extra stuff needs to be excised out of the mRNA. And this is done by what's called RNA processing. So imagine you just, here's the DNA. So this molecule... This is the DNA, okay? And from the DNA, we just transcribed and made an mRNA. Now, this mRNA, though, contains not only the good stuff, but all the junk that was in between. The good stuff is called exons. 
Now, I didn't make this up. I wish they had done this the other way around, right? But the good stuff is called exons, the stuff that's going to be important for proteins, and the junk is called introns. So the introns, what we're going to see is in a moment, the introns are going to get cut out. This is that processing. So the RNA, in this first RNA molecule, we're going to cut out all the junk, the purple, and what that's going to leave now is just the good stuff, right? So we've taken just that good inch and a half or inch out of the six feet, and we've linked those good parts together, and we got rid of the junk. So this is RNA processing. Again, to me, it's backwards in my mind. If I were going to name these things, I would keep the introns in, mm -hmm. and I would get rid of the exons. They would exit, but I didn't make the stuff up. Okay, so exons are kept. Introns are in between junk, right? That's where the word came from. So what we see now is that within your body, you have genes. We used to think that the human had about 100,000 genes. Right? We used to think there were 100,000 genes. And then it was dropped to about 80,000. And then you read in books there were only 75,000 genes. And then the number keeps on dropping. And then about 2,000, we had the Human Genome Project. And when we finally were able to sequence all of the human genome, we now think we only have about 18,000 genes. But we have about 100,000 proteins in our body. So there's 100,000 genes that are responsible for making about 100,000 proteins. All of the genes in your body are called your genome or the human genome. All of the proteins in your body or in us as a human organism would be considered the proteome. Okay, so the genome, the genes, all of them, are going to make all the proteins the proteome. And what we see is that the proteome is much larger than the genome, right? There are only 18,000 genes, but there's 100,000 proteins. How is it that 18,000 genes can give us instructions to make 100,000 proteins? And it has to do with this processing. So as the... the cell is processing this DNA into mRNA, it can cut out different cassettes, little, little parts of this. So here, again, is that initially made RNA. And in some situations, the cell would connect only exons 1, 2, and 4 and make this protein. But in another scenario, it may link together exons 1, 3, and 5, which makes a totally different protein. So one gene, we now know, can make multiple proteins, multiple versions of that protein. Okay. So this is the way by which we have a limited number of genes making a much larger number of proteins. And I think you'll find in your list of words for your sentences, proteome is one of those words. Okay, so now you understand what the proteome is. It's a collection of all the proteins found in your cells or in your body. So transcription then, what is it again? It's taking the DNA, instructions from the DNA, and making from it mRNA. Now that mRNA, M stands for messenger. This is an RNA molecule that's going to be a messenger. It's going to carry the message from the DNA to the rest of the cell. In this case, the DNA is in the nucleus, right? DNA is always in the nucleus. The chromosomes are in the nucleus. And this message is then going to be translated into protein. Now, where are proteins made? Proteins are made out on the ribosome. And where are ribosomes found? They're stuck on the rough ER, or they're just kind of floating out in the cytoplasm. But either way, proteins are made out in the cytoplasm. DNA is in the nucleus. So how are we going to get the information from the DNA out to the ribosome? And the answer is this messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is the messenger. It carries, right, just like a, a, a messenger is going to carry the information from the DNA and send it out of the nucleus and hang it out to the ribosomes. And then the ribosomes are going to take that message and make protein. So that means that transcription must happen in the nucleus, right? Because that's where the DNA is in the first place. So in this cartoon, what we see is our double-stranded DNA. Right, there's a the red, double-stranded DNA. 
there's a lot more to this. We're making this the 30,000 foot flyover overview of transcription, but the DNA then makes itself available and this yellow is the single stranded mRNA molecule. Right? It was made by looking at the DNA and taking A's and G's and C's and T's and making what we know to be the mRNA. So this process of going from DNA to messenger RNA, this is transcription, and this has to happen in the nucleus. Has to be, has to be, has to be. That's where the DNA is. Okay. Then, as I said, what happens next is that that messenger RNA is going to leave the nucleus. It's going to go through those nuclear pores. Remember the nuclear? The nucleus has those big gaping holes in it. Not only did ribosomes get made in the nucleus and have to go out to the cytoplasm, but these mRNA molecules are huge, and they also have to leave the nucleus and go out to the cytoplasm. So the mRNA is going to leave the nucleus, go out to the cytoplasm, and there will run into some ribosomes, and that's where the proteins will be made. And this is the general idea of molecular biology, of cell biology, that we start off with DNA that is found in the nucleus, and this is what Watson and Crick talked about, right? Watson and Crick, as soon as they made their little tinker toy model of DNA, realized, ah, this must be how it goes. So the DNA is transcribed, right? Information is taken from the DNA to make mRNA. That mRNA then leaves the nucleus and takes that message out to the ribosome where translation occurs to create the proteins. So looking at it in picture, there's my double-stranded DNA. Through the process of transcription, I make mRNA. That mRNA is now going to squiggle through the nuclear pore. Right? There's another nuclear pore right there. It now, that RNA, is now going to bump into a ribosome. Now, for simplicity, this big purple dude is the ribosome. That would be a free ribosome. They did not show us the endoplasmic reticulum, right, which would have ribosomes on it. That would clutter the picture. But a lot of the ribosomes would be stuck on the ER. And it's from this ribosome that the mRNA, which carries the message, will be translated to make the protein. That's the basic story. Right, that's the story. Now, if you go back and look at your 11 words, I think you've got them all. Because also in that story, in, the, in those words, there was DNA, mRNA, proteome, transcription, and translation. Right? So now you should be able to, if I stopped right now and told you nothing else, you should be able to, with this information, now create your three sentences with good certainty. Please let other people read them, talk about them, make sure they make sense. I will not, though, just for my own policy, I will not receive your, your, your sentences and check them for you. So please don't send me, would you please read over my sentences and let me know if they're okay? Do that amongst yourselves, right? I, I'm not going to grade them twice. It's just, I'm not going to do it, okay? So figure it out, look at it, peer review them, look at them with each other, have other people read them, make sure they make sense. When you come into the test next week, you won't be able to bring those sentences in. They'll need to be up in your head. But if you understand this, you don't have to memorize it, right? You know the story. You can just rewrite your sentences. It won't be a problem. Here's another picture of the same exact thing. I want you to fill in the name of the process. So what is number one? Number one, going from DNA to RNA, that is? Transcription, right? Now, these two words are in alphabetical order. <laughs> you have to go out about six letters to see it, right? But transcription does alphabetically come before translation if you forget which one comes first. Then, what would number two represent? Number two, we're taking the mRNA and we're going to process it, right? We're going to process, cut out those introns, relink the exons. So number two is really processing. And then once you're out, you squiggle through the nuclear membrane, through the nuclear pore, and then once this is now your mRNA. The purple guy is the ribosome. And now I'm going to go from the mRNA to the protein. So number three is the process of translation. Translation. So let's talk about translation. Translation is the second part of this. It's the actual synthesis of the proteins. It happens in the cytoplasm, right? It has to be in the cytoplasm because that's where the ribosomes are. Again, the mRNA is going to take the information from the DNA. It's going to go through those nuclear pores. It's, the mRNA is going to come out and, and hang on to some ribosomes. 
and the ribosomes are then going to make the protein. Now, there's another molecule involved in this process called transfer RNA. Give me a moment, and I'll show you those transfer RNAs. This may help you as well um, when you think about this process, especially if this is new, brand new for you. Remember that DNA is A, C, Gs, and Ts. We, was, we know that DNA is a nucleic acid, and it's made of nucleotides. mRNA is also a nucleic acid, and it's made up of nucleotides, right? So I'm transcribing. What does the word transcribe mean to you? We don't hear this word very much. There used to be people who went to school specifically to be transcriptionists. There are still medical transcriptionists. What do they do? They listen to the doctor's orders and they transcribe, right? They take the, they take the verbal and they put it into type, right? They type it up. They're transcribing. They're still in the same language. They're taking English, if you will, and typing it into English notes on a computer. Transcription, transcribe. But then what, so that's what's going on. DNA to RNA, you're still in the same language. You're still using the A, C, G, and T, the same alphabet, the same language. There's a little change, right? T's become U's. Other than that, it's the same thing. But then when you go on the ribosome and you go from mRNA to protein, you're now changing it completely. You are translating it. You're now going from an alphabet of four nucleotides to an alphabet of 20 amino acids. You're going from English to Russian. You're going from English to Mandarin. This is a major translation issue going on. So the ribosome becomes the translator, if you will, and we're now translating into a totally new language. Right? And that's what the ribosome does. So looking at this picture, same old thing. Number one, there's the DNA. It's in the nucleus. Number two, the process of transcription comes out into the cytoplasm. This big purple guy is the ribosome. And now we see the mRNA. Now on this cartoon, you can actually see enough detail. You see four different colors, blue, orange, green, and yellow. Those represent what four things? A, C, G, and U, right? Because this is RNA. And the ribosome now is going to have this other molecule associated with it called a tRNA. Finish the conversation, then we'll be done. The tRNA stands for transfer RNA. It's an RNA molecule. And what it's going to do is carry a, an amino acid. These little purple spheres and red spheres are the different amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids. And it's going to carry the right amino acid to the ribosome. How does the ribosome know which amino acid to bring in? There's a series of three letters, right? And we call those three letters a triplet, or another word, codon. It codes for a particular amino acid to be brought to the ribosome. So now what we see in the big picture, as we finish up right now, is that the DNA has A, C, Gs, and Ts. Those A, C, Gs, and Ts are then used to give instructions to the messenger RNA, ACGs and U's. Those ACGs and U's then go to the ribosome and reading in groups of three, only in groups of three, the tRNA then brings over the right amino acid. In the end, what we end up with is a protein, right? A long chain of amino acids that make up the protein. Now what I'll do is on Thursday, I'll finish up this story. We'll finish up with the last little bit about mutations and then we'll move into a quick review of histology. You've already had histology in lab, right? Um, or we'll, yeah, you've all had it. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. You've already seen epithelial and connective tissues. I'll give you a few more details about histology. We'll get that finished up probably on Thursday. And then next Tuesday, we'll finish up any histology and give you a little bit about skin and the integumentary system. So our exam next week will be over cells and organelles and transcription and translation, It'll, mutations, cancer, all this conversation. It'll be over histology, which you've already been seeing in lab, and it'll be over skin, which you saw just a little tiny bit in lab, and we'll talk more about the layers of skin. Okay? So come up and see me if you have any questions. Again, this lecture will be posted to YouTube. Have a great day.